cool one thing about composting is that you need to source your materials. Uh, most farms have not necessarily uh, equal amount of browns and greens. So like in the springtime, if you're a market gardener or a farmer, you're most likely gonna have a lot of lettuces and green things, but not necessarily a lot of woody stuff. Um, at the end of the season, you're going to more likely, if you're growing a variety of things, you're going to more likely have a mix of greens or browns. So you've got stocky stuff from your tomato plants, and then you've also got green stuff from leaves and pulling weeds and like that. But you might not have both, so you might have to, if you're wanting to get compost going on your farm or on a garden scale, you might have to bring some materials in to help you. I always try to source materials for free or where I'm not having to pay for them. And I don't think that you should ever have to pay for a feedstock. There's plenty of waste, waste, which I like to call a resource, uh, in the world that people are trying to find a way to get rid of that you just have to make connections and um, you know, make it known that you're trying to find material and just kind of reach out to people and see what they have that they're trying to get rid of. So for brown material, there's a company, a lot of you may have heard of it, called Chip Drop. You get on their website, I think it's just chipdrop.com. Um, you put in your information and then if there's, there's a lot of tree trimmers that are signed up with Chip Drop and they'll, I don't know how this, I don't know how it works, but they get your information and then when you're, they're in your area, they'll dump trips for you wherever you tell them to. Um, I have signed up for this and I live in a rural area and I've never got contacted from them. And I've heard the same thing from other people who live in rural areas that there's just not, they just don't come near there or they don't know to check. So if you live in a more rural area, um, keep an eye out and just like, if you see a tree truck, either immediately take down the number or just stop and talk to the guys and say, hey, I live right there. I know you're probably gonna have to take this and dump it somewhere at the end of the day. Why don't you save some gas and dump it at my house and then like mark an area for them to dump it. Hopefully they're not a company that's like also throwing their lunch trash in the, in the chips, because that happens. Uh, you can also collect leaves. So um, I, I live near Nashville and my, in like where my daughter lives with her mom, there's a, it's a more upscale residential area where a lot of people have their leaves cleaned up and then we'll have like, you know, 10, 20 bags of leaves sitting out by the side of the road that they're waiting to be hauled away and I'm willing to haul it away before the other person is, so I just stop and grab those bags of leaves. And I, you might want to take, a, if you were to do this, make sure that you peek in and then make sure that it is leaves, um, that you're not getting something that you don't want, because people will put other stuff in those bags. Any preference of trees? No. Um, he asked if there was a preference of trees, and normally you're getting a mix anyway, because it's in somebody's yard, so I don't really necessarily care about that. Uh, that's just one way of getting more brown material. Um, or if you felt called to, you could set up a, uh, a drop site in the fall and like put it out on social media or if you have some type of way to let people know or like you go to church and put it up on a bulletin board, hey, uh, drop your leaves off on this weekend and then hopefully you have a truck or a way of hauling all those leaves to your residence or farm and you could use, all, take advantage of all those people's leaves and have them do part of the work for you where they're bringing it to you. Yes? I've thought about that. So she was asking about chemicals being used because there's so many chemicals used in landscapes and lawn care and landscapes. I don't usually normally worry about trees. If you were getting a mixture of something from someone, like a, if you had a deal with like, uh, if you're friends with a landscape company or something like that, and you were getting like trimmings from them, like their grass and what they're cutting off of uh, when they're like tri trimming hedges and stuff like that. Um, I would be concerned if it's like someone who's using chemicals on the lawn and stuff like that, but not necessarily trees. I, I haven't found it to be an issue and I've listened to uh, like, tried to see if other people have ever had issues and I've never found it to be a problem. But straw, that's what I had mentioned. So I had considered, so many people use straw at, you know, straw bales in harvest time, like as a, um, out on their front porch, like a little display that they're just gonna send somewhere afterwards. But like I said, I've considered, I was like, oh man, there's so much straw that's going to waste, but 
there's so much straw that's been sprayed that you don't want to take the chance of getting a residual herbicide, so I don't even mess with any straw bales. So if you need, if you've got a lot of brown things and you need to get more greens, you can talk to local restaurants near you and see if you can leave a bin with them to collect food waste. Um, you mainly need to kind of educate the people who are, who work there, what goes in there and wasn't, what doesn't go in there. Uh, that's the main issue that you're going to have working with anyone when you're collecting food waste. Um, breweries, wineries, breweries have spent, spent grain that they're always willing to give to people because they have to find a way to get rid of it. Wineries have crushed grapes and stems. Uh, there's a lady near me that they do indigo dyes, so they have tons of plant material, like truckloads of plant material per day that they're trying to get rid of, or other types of organic business waste. Like I was saying, there's paper pulp. A lot of so you got to be careful because some of that's been bleached, but Find, find organic things that need organics recycling and then just kind of ask a few questions to make sure that no chemicals were used in the process or anything that's going to be detrimental to the microorganisms that we're working with. If you need high, nitri high nitrogen, the best thing that I found to do is to go muck a barn or if people have rabbits that they keep, it's a little bit easier to clean up and you can just get bucket pulls of rabbit poop or clean up alpacas, llamas, whatever. For moisture, the best thing that you want to do while assembling a pile is to mist things as you're building a pile. You want to get everything equally moist. A lot of people will build a compost pile, put a layer down, so like they'll put some wood chips down and then they'll spray it with a hose. And then they'll put a layer in and they'll spray it with a hose. And they'll put another and they'll spray it with a hose. And what happens normally is that the very top gets kind of wet and then it all runs through and doesn't really penetrate anything and just goes to the bottom. And so you want to make sure that everything's going to get an equal amount of moisture and it's good to have like a, if you're building just like a hand turned pile, um, if you're standing there mixing stuff or adding it in and have another person or if you have a kid, have them standing there with the hose misting everything while you're adding it to the pile. If you were to be on a large scale, like if you were to do windrows, you could set up some type of spray rig where you're hosing down your pile. Uh, some people have, I've seen like a truck rigged with a, a sprayer, not a boom, but like a half or a quarter arc spray where they're driving along and it's just spraying out to one side. Um, any way to get some water or moisture onto the pile. Uh, another thing that you can do is to, so if you've got a pile that you've built that's kind of pyramid shaped or conical shaped, you can level out the top so that you're creating more surface area on the top of it that's going to collect rainwater or even make like a, make it where it comes like that where you're getting, collecting rain like in a gutter at the top to try and get more moisture into, the, into your pile if you happen to have dry ingredients and you can't reach it with a hose or something like that. And then you can also spray down your uh, compost pile with compost tea and you'll get that much faster breakdown and decomposition because you're getting a lot more microbes onto the surface of that material and um, it'll just break down exponentially faster. I've, I'll have extra tea when I go out on tea sprays for my business and I'll come home and have extra and I'll spray down my compost pile. and I've notice considerably go faster like after I spray it. You know, like it's not like you're going out the next, door, next day and seeing a bunch of breakdown, but the next month you're like, whoa, that's breaking down way more than another pile that hasn't been sprayed. Uh, so also with management, the main thing that you want to manage is the temperatures. So with thermal composting, you want uh, research was done, I'm not sure way back when, I think it was when uh, Albert Howard was doing the indoor method that they did this research, but I'm not for sure about that. But they found that a 51, 55 degrees Celsius or 131 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature that you need to reach that or above to kill, start killing pathogens and weed seeds that are in your material. So like the organic standards say that you need to, if you want to have organic compost or follow organic standards, if you're an organic certified farm, you need to uh, maintain a temperature above 131 degrees for 15 days and turn it five times within that period. When I was at Rodale, Elaine and I were trying to change that so that we were turning according to temperature. And so that's what we're doing with focusing on biology is watching our temperatures so that we're not going anaerobic. With the temperature, we're wanting to 
maintain temperatures so that we're focusing on what's going to be best for the biology within that pile and how we're going to get the most biology and bang for our buck by making good compost, good quality compost. So you want to stay between 131 and 160 or 165. Once it hits 165 or 170 degrees, it can spontaneously combust. I've never seen this happen, but it has been known to happen like with wood, chips pile, wood chip piles. Um, a place that has like a large store of wood chip piles will catch on fire and have a big fire. You maintain, you want to check your temperatures with a thermometer. I brought my example here. So you want a stainless steel thermometer. A lot of thermometers, when you go to just your average garden center, they're most likely going to have an aluminum thermometer, but aluminum's uh, not as strong as stainless steel. And if you're, you know, adding chunky stuff into your, into your compost pile and you accidentally hit that when, hit something chunky when you're sticking your aluminum thermometer in there, it could cause it to bend and then that's going to screw up your temperatures in the future. So it's best to go with stainless steel and spend a little bit more. Uh, I don't know a lot of other companies that, that make these. The best company that you could go to is RioTemp. It's RioTemp.com. When you go to their website, there's headings at the top there and they have a specific page for nothing but composting thermometers. And you can get compost thermometers from two to six feet long. This is a four foot thermometer, so it looks like a meat thermometer. And you want to get the first two or three inches here are what are going to be reading the temps. And so you want to get those into the core of your pile so that you're getting a good temperature reading. It's usually good to take at least th three readings on a compost pile. You want to at least get a couple. This, and this will take, using these thermometers, it's going to take a couple minutes of sitting there waiting for it to get up to temperature and get the exact reading. You can purchase these, just a little side note. So when you go to Rio Temp, uh, because they're selling them for people around the world, we in the United States do Fahrenheit. They have Fahrenheit only, they have Celsius only, and then they have a combination of Fahrenheit and Celsius. This one I brought with me is the combination of Fahrenheit and Celsius. The only issue that I have with these, so you want to calibrate your thermometers every now and then. If you're banging them around, like on my drive here, it's getting banged around and stuff. There's a little screw on the back here. So you would put this in a cup or jar of ice water with mostly ice. And you want to check your freezing temperature to calibrate it to your freezing temperature. And then you would also want to compare it to the boiling temperature. And my issue with the Rio temp ones is that the ones that either are just Fahrenheit or the Fahrenheit and Celsius, it only goes up to 200 degrees and 212 degrees is the boiling point so you can't necessarily calibrate it at the top side and it's frustrating to me because I'm a perfectionist. And I've mentioned this to them but they don't want to change just because I've mentioned it to them. But So if you're wanting to be exact and wanting to be perfect, you have to buy the, the Celsius one but then if you're in the United States and you have to convert all your temperatures, which is just frustrating. When you go to their website, they've also got this little orange handle that you can screw onto these things that's supposed to make it safer. I don't think that it's worth the extra money. You do have to be really careful with things so that they don't bend so you kind of grab it and, and keep it straight as you're pushing it into the pile and watch out for anything that you might be hitting. The last time I put on this presentation, I didn't have a thermometer with me, so that's a picture of the thermometer. So that one good temperature of 153. Yes? Um, I, my last pile I made, I kept it at 135, and I kept it at that by turning it because it was going hotter. I should have let it go yeah. all the way up. I wanted to go. Yeah. Or, it turned out OK, but yeah, we're it, gonna I never about... let it go above 140. We're going to be getting to that in just a few slides here, so I'll go into detail on, and I'll hopefully answer what you're trying to figure out. And if I don't, ask me later. <laughs> <laughs>